Hi, I am Ashish Suresh from New York University. Uh, hello, this is Sri Harsha. Uh, I'm from San Francisco State University. Uh, hi, it's Gautam Ranjan from State University of New York, Binghamton. Yeah. Hey, this is Vinay Teja from University of South Alabama. Okay. I'm Shriyans from New York University. Hi, all. So human civilization has reached a point where in inhabiting other planets uh, other than the Earth has become more necessi necessity. And based on the huge current research going on, uh, Mars is the most preferable planet. So we are proposing an innovative low-cost Mars flyby space, uh, spacecraft for safe interplanetary human machine. So here. Uh, we are using the uh, ISRO's PSLV XL, which is a most successful rocket, and this rocket is taking two humans to the Earth low, uh, the Earth low orbit, and the rocket is having four stages of propulsion. Uh, propulsion, it's solid, liquid, solid, liquid, and it, it it will be taking two humans to the low Earth orbit, and. Uh, this rocket is not as power, powerful as the NASA's rocket. And so that we are using a elliptical, this uh, elliptical concept that, that is when we are putting the uh, spacecraft with two humans on the lower th elliptical orbit, and the spacecraft sta starts orbiting around the Earth. So whenever. So whenever it is close to the Earth, we are igniting the main engine and increasing the speed so that it enters the next orbit. So it's gaining acceleration. So it's like it goes around for like 25 days, and after six main uh, engine burn, it gains enough energy uh, to overcome the Earth sphere of influence. That is, it's almost gained the escape velocity. So after getting the escape velocity, we are beaming it to the inspirational mass trajectory. This is the inspirational mass trajectory. So for example, we are launching the uh, rocket on December 17th. So it needs around 25 days so uh, to reach the escape velocity thing. So it's taking 25 days. So after 25 days, we will be it's around some January 5th, 2017. Yeah, it's the 5th January 2018. Yeah, so once the escape velocity is gained, we are beaming it to the inspirational mass trajectory, and it will take around 253 days to reach near the mass. So we are not landing on the mass, we are just flybying as the first attempt. And here, uh, once we have beamed it to the trajectory, uh, we are not using any main engines. We will be using just the mm, thrusters to correct the trajectories. And we are also using star sensors and gyroscope to have the perfect trajectory to reach the mass. And it will reach the mass by around 253 days. And this, uh, we have incorpor incorporated a deep sleep mechanism inside our sp sp spacecraft so that the humans can go to sleep for around 27 days without any problem. And it can save a lot of food and water requirement. So after uh, 253 days, it will uh, reach the mass around 21st August, uh, 21st August 2008. And after that, it will take the free return path so on 21st August 2018, it will be reaching Mars. 
and after that it will start the free return uh, trajectory and it will take around 273 days and on and on 21st may we will be back to earth and we we will be using the same apollo landing process to land back to earth now sri arsha my friend will discuss more about the launch vehicles Uh, a, a launch vehicle provides the velocity needed by a spacecraft uh, to move out of the Earth's orbit uh, and set its on its course to Mars. So generally, a launch vehicle in a space flight is a rocket-powered vehicle used to trans uh, transport a spacecraft beyond Earth's atmosphere and enter into orbit around Earth or some other destination in outer space. Uh, so, uh, according to our design, uh, we designed it to launch in 2024. So, there will be an uh, advantage of favorable launch opportunity when Earth and Mars are in advantageous positions in their orbits uh, for Mars landing. So, basically, this occurs like for every 26 months, Earth, Mars, and Sun align for the most efficient and least energy consuming path uh, between Earth and Mars. Uh, that means it would take less power to get to Mars relative to other times when Earth and Mars are in different positions around their, uh, around their orbits uh, around Sun. So when, generally when mission planners are considering different launch vehicles, what they take into con consideration is the, how, how much mass uh, each launch vehicle can carry. Uh, so we are using the PSLV XL. Uh, PSLV is the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, which is used by India. So this PSLV XL is the, it's an operator version of uh, PSLV uh, uh, with uh, standard uh, configurations uh, like boost, uh, more powerful boosters and uh, stretched strap-on boosters are used. So uh, generally in um, PSLV, uh, we use a large one meter diameter and 13.5 meter length motors and carries 12 tons of solid propellants uh, instead of the nine tons used in the earlier configuration as this is an operator version. Uh, this PSLV is uh, successfully tested by ISRO on 29 December 2005 for the launch of Chandrayaan-1. So it was a successful attempt. Uh, Then about the vehicle description, uh, generally PSLV uses, four, they ha there will be four stages of uh, propulsion systems, like uh, in the first uh, solid, liquid, solid, liquid, alternatively. In the first stage, like one of the largest solid rocket motors in the world uh, is used. It carries 138 tons of HTPB propellant and develops a maximum thrust of 4,800 kilonewton. And it has a 2.8 meter diameter motor case. Uh, motor case is made of uh, maraging steel and has an empty mass of 30,000 kilograms. Uh, in the first stage, uh, pitch and yaw control are provided by SITVC, uh, which injects an aqueous solution of uh, strontium perchlorate into the nozzle to produce uh, asymmetric uh, thrust. Then the, the solution is stored in two cylindrical al aluminum tanks strapped to solid rocket, rocket most, uh, motors and pressurized with nitrogen. And roll control is provided by two liquid, small liquid engines on the opposite uh, sides of the stage. Uh, they are called ro roll control thrusters. Uh, this is the PSLV uh, Indian vehicle, rocket. Uh, as you can see, there are four stages and uh, strap-on um, boosters in the down. Uh, in the first stage, uh, there will be six strap-on solid boosters. Uh, four boosters are ground lit, and the remaining two ignite uh, 25 seconds after launch. Uh, in PSLV XL, we, we use large boosters with 12 tons of propellant and produce 719 kilonewton thrust. Uh, two strap-on boosters are equipped with uh, SITVC for additional attitude control. Uh, in the second stage, uh, we use a Vicus engine and carries 41.5 ton of liquid propellant, uh, UDMH as fuel, and nitrogen tetroxide as oxidizer. Uh, it generates a maximum thrust of 800 kilonewton. Uh, in the third stage, uh, we use seven tons of HTPB solid propellant again, and it produces a maximum thrust of 240 kilonewton. 
Uh, here, uh, role control is provided by this another fourth-stage uh, four reaction control system. Uh, in the in the fourth stage, uh, we have this twin engine burning monomethyl hydrazine and mixed oxidizers, uh, ox oxides of nitrogen. Uh, here, each engine uh, generates 7.4 kN thrust and is uh, it's gimbaled to provide pitch, yaw, and roll control during powered flight. Uh, this stage carries 2,500 kg of propellant, uh, and as you can see, the different pitch yaw roll controls of each stage is there. And these are the specifications of complete launch vehicle. And the weight distribution of the payload, uh, the weight uh, distribution is in such a way that for the launch pad, it's 2,500 kg. And for a dry mass, it's 500 kg. And propellant mass is 500 kg. So entire payload mass will be 3,500 kg. And these are the approximate cost estimations according to ISRO's PSLV Excel. Uh, then coming to the rocket, uh, my friend will explain about the rocket the controlling system and everything. Oh, okay. Uh, I am looking after the design of the spacecraft. Uh, so uh, I think we have very less time. So I'll go to it. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the spacecraft that I designed in Canada. So it's something like that. So go to this. Uh, yeah. These are the uh, uh, you know details of the interior. Like uh, there is. Uh, okay. Go to next page. That you can see. Uh, the first one is astronaut hibernation cabin. Uh, and the second one is control system and data analysis center. These are the two uh, main part of this stuff that uh, I have designed. This is the basic design. Okay. Okay. And uh, I have done some basic cost analysis on the basis of uh, whatever material I'm using to design this stuff. The main materials are like uh, this. Uh, there will be four layers. So the first one is the interior one, the aluminium alloy. The innermost that will give the uh, uh, support uh, for the you know uh, composite material that I'll be using. This is RX six one. Uh, this is for uh, uh, radiation uh, setting, and this is carbon carbon composite. It gives uh, high strength, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know very less dense. So, uh, and this is ablat ablating tiles, the outermost layer. Uh, okay, go to next. Uh, so uh, these are the details of the uh, design that uh, you know basic design of the spacecraft. Uh, what parts I'm using. Uh, means uh, you can see the gyroscope, the uh, uh, camera, and this is the accelerator, and uh, means all the details are here. Uh, uh, this is like, and basically, what uh, why I'm taking the, uh, these parts here because I want to go for the you know uh, basic calculations. Actually, uh, my project is like I have to optimize the cost. Okay, so that I'm dealing with. These are, uh, the, yeah. These are the basic calculations that I have done uh, uh, on the basis of material and the uh, mass of material that I'm using. So it comes around uh, 107, uh, 132.2 crore, that is around uh, 19 or 20 uh, billion dollars. Okay. Billion dollars. Uh, these are the parts that I'm using, and these are the details like a spacecraft casing that will be four layer. Gyroscope, micrometer, camera, accelerometer, high beam, antenna, and for communication. That's the next. Yeah. yeah. The next part that uh, hibernation cabin, uh, that was also designed in Canada. That's why it will be. So in order to achieve a good mission, mission uh, to Mars, we need a healthy astronauts. So in order to sustain for a, such a long duration of mission, mission or in order to sustain till we go for Mars, we need to have uh, astronauts with good health, and they need to maintain their, uh, uh, they shouldn't face any health problems in the mission. mission. And generally, we humans are sust uh, able to sustain any environment, and we can able to go with any pace of uh, climate change. But uh, during the flight of such a long duration, we need to, uh, astronauts should be able to uh, should not face any health issues. So generally, when astronauts are in a long mission, they face a bone density, loss of bone density. And uh, these are due to lack of calcium and uh, due to uh, lack of their uh, exercising. 
So in order to prevent all these uh, health problems, so our, uh, what we planned is like a, a deep sleep mechanism. So it, that will help uh, astronaut to uh, decrease all their health problems that they had in earlier missions. So in order to decrease uh, like body toxic management due to uh, and uh, cardiac control, generally when uh, an astronaut undergoes a huge uh, long mission, they under, uh, they, uh, their heart will get compressed and it, it won't function well. And uh, their bone losses will uh, give them less energy to work in the mi in, uh, mission. So to, uh, in order to come over that, a deep sleep mechanism was uh, being researched right now. So for if crew are inactive during their mission towards, uh, for the mission, then they can able to uh, withstand all, all the pressure they, they are facing during the flight. And uh, that will, if they are inactive and going to sleep for such a long duration, they can have, a, a week, uh, we can have a lot of space in, uh, uh, in the chamber that, uh, that is being traveled. And uh, by that, we can reduce the uh, resources can be reduced for that sake. So uh, that will indirectly decrease the payload, and that will decrease the cost. So, uh, and with that aspect into consideration, we can even build a habitat in the chamber. It can rotate uh, by itself. That will provide an artificial gravity because there is no gravity while we travel. Uh, so in order to may, uh, in, uh, not to have a zero gravity, we can at least in introduce some gravity and uh, that will uh, give astronauts a good feel and uh, health during their uh, way. So, and that can be, uh, can uh, with, while we decrease the resources, that will help us to give a lot of uh, protective shield around the chamber. This can be achieved by, the, uh, by different states, as you can see, by torpor state and using chemicals or drugs and by decreasing uh, brain activity. But mainly the most successful state as per our research uh, is the torpor state, which has uh, two cases in that. One is uh, total parental nutrition and another one is therapeutic hypothermia. Therapeutic hypothermia, is the one with uh, uh, astronauts' bodies are cool enough uh, to sustain a temperature, uh, and their bodies are maintained at a temperature of around 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and that will re decrease the metabolic rate of uh, astronauts, and uh, that will let them to sleep of 14 days, but our goal is to let them sleep for at least of 27 days, and that uh, there, there should be more research should carry on in this aspect. And uh, uh, there are, uh, the stages in this uh, hypothermia is body cooling, uh, giving them sedation and uh, introducing nutrition and rewarming their body to uh, attain a good pace when they reach the mass. So the main concept behind this is that body cooling can be achieved with the present uh, bio bio biomedical research, but uh, sed sedation can also be introduced by drugs. And uh, nutrition is the main aspect that they need to sustain for now. Uh, in the present, uh, there are two ways of providing nutrition to the astronauts during their deep sleep uh, uh, mechanism uh, under, under, while they undergo the deep sleep mechanism through fluids, which can be pumped through their veins that we see like saline uh, or uh, saline water that we introduce to patients. Uh, another way is with uh, fluids pumping through the central venous catheter. This is another way we can uh, able to provide uh, nutrition to uh, astronauts. The, and this is how they look in the chamber when they are sleeping uh, or taking hibernation. We can say it hibernation. There are thermal pads. We, uh, Agautam, he designed this uh, using CATIA with, uh, uh, this, this shows what, what, uh, whatever I mentioned in previous slides about uh, hypothermia management and how the tubes are connected to the uh, astronaut. And uh, this is, there is a protective shield. I'm talking about the protective shield that can be covered uh, to prevent the ra radiation. And uh, yeah, the landing will be done by my friend. Uh, so as the name suggests, we are using the Apollo landing system for our landing. And uh, this system is uh, extensively engineered, and this system is a successful one. Uh, so we are using parachutes. We are using nine parachutes for the landing because it's very important to complete the mission if uh, we have landed successfully with no loss of life and anything. So uh, here we are using the probabilistic approach. Uh, according to the probabilistic approach, uh, if there are series of failure or if there are links of failure, 
uh, then we, we would take that into the con consideration. If the probability of failure is more, we will take into the consideration. And otherwise, if the probability is less, we will just ignore them. And those failures would be taken care of by uh, extensive research and would be, uh, like, solution would be found, uh, found out for those. And, uh, like, we have uh, nine parachutes for this. Uh, three parachutes, th uh, there are three pilot parachutes, three main parachutes, uh, two drop parachutes, and one heat shield augmentation parachutes. So our landing procedure starts at uh, 21,000 feet. Uh, here, uh, first parachute, that is uh, forward heat shield, is deployed. Uh, then uh, after, uh, after the gap of 1.6 seconds, we have drop parachutes. Uh, those, uh, those parachutes are five meter in diameter, and uh, they are reefed slowly. Uh, uh, they are reefed slowly till the 11,000, uh, till the uh, spacecraft has reached the 11,000 feet. And at the 11,000 feet, uh, our three pilot uh, procedure for uh, deploying the three pilot parachute starts. Uh, so these, uh, uh, after the pilot, uh, three, uh, this thing, three pilot parachutes, we have the main parachutes, which are 25.4 meters in diameter. And uh, they are reefed in the two stages. The first stage uh, takes nearly six seconds, and the other stage, uh, second stage, where they are actually deployed, it takes nearly uh, 10 seconds uh, for this procedure. It can be better understood with the help of this diagram. So it starts at uh, over there from the one. Uh, there the heat, uh, augmentation, uh, heat, uh, heat uh, shield parachute is deployed. Then we have the drop parachutes, and then pilot parachutes, and main parachutes. And, and in the end, when it lands on the water, uh, these parachutes are uh, uh, removed so that it can float on the water easily. And I'll conclude our slide, uh, our presentation with this. This is a basic cost estimation. As we have done this project in India, so we have also calculated in the Indian currency and the US dollars. Uh, so I think this is the, like, uh, this is the most efficient uh, uh, system which anyone has built. Like, uh, it would cost around, uh, everything would cost around nearly 104.44 million US dollars from space segment, ground segment, uh, segment including everything, project management, contingency, prog uh, program elements, launch cost, and landing. So this is it. And if you have any questions, me and my team are here to answer them. problem for infants, uh, like in the medical terms, there are quite a bit of biological terms involved in this, but uh, I can't remember right now. And, but uh, for infants in a critical care, what they use, we can use the same medicines with a bit overdose, but uh, what they are achieved in the research present going on is like just 14 days. That can be, that should be increased for this mission up to 27 days. But I am not sure exactly with the medical term, but it is the same for infant child care. Yeah, I would like to add uh, to my friend. Actually, what we are doing in uh, hibernation uh, uh, mechanism is like we are trying to reduce the requirement of the astronauts. Like we are eating something, we are drinking something. So uh, we are trying to reduce that, uh, you know, payload. So uh, according to our uh, design and you know uh, the research work that we have done, so the uh, payload that is required for the astronaut has been reduced to uh, like 63 percent okay so uh, and further uh, there are so many uh, you know scopes uh, if we can uh, do more research then we can be further reading okay. so, so the requirement that is to not is like uh, eating and drinking all that so that is being reduced because uh, the temperature of the astronaut is reduced by 7 to 8 uh, degree celsius during that so that's the basic idea yes please is this procedure published any place uh, yeah, a lot of scientists and uh, researchers are already working on this, but uh, uh, they have yeah. not yet been able to, uh, you know, exactly calculate the amount of, you know, uh, the requirement, uh, uh, like in terms of food and all that. Uh, they are not, they, they, right now they are calculating, but they have not done, you know, with the uh, uh, It's on its way. Actually, they have. They put an adult under for over 14 days. She had um, rabies and they didn't want her to die from rabies. She was a teenager. Infants have a, have a reflex, I'm a medical 
doctor. It just is a reflex that helps keep them alive during these things. But they did put a teenager under for uh, several weeks because they didn't want her to die from rabies, and she came out fine. They used barbiturates to put her in a barbiturate coma, and they used TPN, just like you're describing. Because obviously, you can't eat anything when you're in a coma. But she's the only known person to survive an active case of rabies. Yeah, they, there are there are many side effects that can uh, th uh, that are uh, mean that will be phased during that phase. But uh, you know the uh, biological biomedical researchers are still going on. For now, as for my knowledge, there are there is a case for five days uh, without any food, just the fluids introduced through through the veins. Uh, he or she, she well, they sustain well for uh, those five days without any uh, further care. By the way, the average in the case where uh, they have already some other problems, so we are talking about normal instruments. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to note that the technology readiness level of each component, especially the hibernation part, and whether that would be ready in time by, let's say, which year and which launch window. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, we have some uh, very chat with the scientists, uh, you know, two scientists we have already chatted with. And they were saying that uh, we can't, uh, right now we can't uh, say that what time we will take, but uh, one day there will be a, you know, uh, some thing like that, I mean, some research will prove that, that it is really possible. Okay. And it will really help us to go to Mars or some other, you know. I mean, to, to yeah. state this is a futuristic approach for a Mars mission. Yeah, and that, we, that can be achieved. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and NASA is also planning on the same approach for 2021 this some machine so uh, they are hoping that by that time it will be ready for the 27 days and good job on having a very low question okay thank, thank you. you any other questions yeah there's a question about the uh, you know the, 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 the